Hi everyone. You might have heard the saying, a man with one clock knows what time is it. A man with two clocks is not so sure. And I have two instruments here. They are frequency counters. And they behave a bit like clocks. And the problem is, I have two of them. So when they don't agree, when they measure frequency, is that I don't know which one is right. And in fact, I did a small test. I connected a frequency source to both of them. They disagreed and I'm not sure which one is right. And in fact, none of them is right because the frequency source co I connected to them is actually a GPS DO. It's a very, very precise frequency source. And sure enough, none of them was dead on. I cannot blame them because the reference oscillator they are using internally is simply a crystal oscillator. And crystal oscillators have a relatively big variation in their specifications depending on temperature, also aging, and a lot of other factors. So I asked myself, can I improve these counters? Can I do something better and on a budget because this is my personal lab? So stay tuned and I'm going to show you what I did. One thing to note here is that the two counters I have, a PM6665 and a PM6669, are extremely similar in their construction. And in fact, they use the same type of internal oscillator and it's perfectly interchangeable and the options available for them are the same in terms of frequency oscillator upgrade. So I'm just going to speak of one, but everything I say can be applied to the other model. What I did is simply open the unit first and uh, see how the oscillator was held inside, what it looked like. So let me do that. These units are super easy to open. Every options in them are filled with a label by your user. So that's pretty convenient. Here's what it looks like inside. You have the GPIB option board here and the oscillator board is here. It's simply held by two dabs and a connector. So this is the crystal oscillator board. You can see the 10 megahertz crystal here. It's Philips branded, so that's pretty cool. And then you have simply a logic chip to make an oscillator. You have uh, an adjustable capacitor to adjust the frequency. And that's it, just a few terminals to supply power, uh, one output for the signal, and that's it. There's really not much to it. So I thought myself, can I simply upgrade this? Can I make the oscillator better? Well, of course it's possible because in fact, the manufacturer does sell an upgraded option for that. And I believe they call that an MTCXO, Mathematically Temperature Compensated Crystal Oscillator. The way it works is that instead of having a higher quality reference oscillator, they have one which is very well characterized. And then the firmware in the microcontroller of the unit has a um, table which provides some adjustment according to the ambient temperature. So instead of correcting the oscillator, they correct the output of the, the instrument depending on the temperature. Obviously the advantages are a very low cost, well, relatively lower cost than an OCXO or something like that. And also it has an instant turn on time. Whereas if you have an OCXO, uh, you need for some time for it to heat up and everything like that. So I told myself, can I do an upgrade for that? And it turns out, yes, there are some people that did it on the internet. However, the way they did it, I didn't really like it. One of them simply put uh, TCXO uh, in, instead of the 10 MHz associator. So yeah, you can absolutely put a 10 MHz TCXO and it's going to work perfectly fine. But the reason why I didn't like it is because I couldn't find personally easily a, TC, a 10 MHz TCXO, uh, or at least it was expensive. Maybe I was unlucky, but that was the way it was. And also OCXOs are in general much better in terms of aging and everything. And in fact, it's pretty easy nowadays to find second-hand OCXOs oscillators on eBay. So I just wanted to use that. But the problem is that there were some people who already designed OCXO upgrade boards for this instrument. So why didn't I just simply take their work and, and use it? I didn't do it because in this specific instrument, because it wasn't designed originally to have an OCXO as an oscillator, it did not provide constant power to this connector. And that's a major issue because OCXOs are meant to be constantly powered on. And there are many good reasons for that, which I'm going to get on later in this video. So I had to do it differently because the way people did it is simply put an OCXO in there and then they say, oh, you just turn on the instrument, wait for it to heat up after some time and you'll be fine. But no, you won't be fine because, well, it will work and it will probably be more precise than this, but you won't get all the precision that, that you should get from the OCXO. 
So I designed my own board, uh, which has an OCX oscillator, and let me present it to you. So this is what I made. So this is a replacement board, which is drop-in compatible with the original board. It has a 10 MHz OCXO on eBay. It's a very cheap one. It costs maybe around $5. Um, a small switching power supply. So it has its own power supply, an input terminal, just a production fuse, just in case, a few passive components, a voltage reference, and uh, a trim pot to adjust the frequency. And how is my design different than the ones you can find on the internet? It's different because instead of taking power from here, from the, the normal um, input terminal for the oscillator option, there is an extra input terminal there. And the way you're supposed to use that is to connect that input straight at the output of the transformer of the unit here. Because luckily, even when you turn the unit off, the transformer stays energized and the on and off switch, in fact, is acting after the transformer and after the full bridge rectifier then you, then you see here, the capacitors and everything. So it means that inside this unit, I have a permanent power source and I can simply connect myself to it and have my OCXO energized all the time. So what I'm going to do now is show you quickly the schematics of the, um, the, the unit, the power supply portion of the unit, and I will explain to you some of the design choices I've made. And uh, yeah, let's do that now. I have a printout of the power supply portion of the service manual, and it's a very pr pretty simple design. So we have the main input voltage that starts here. It goes through a mainline filter, then it goes through the transformer, which is right there. Then it goes through a full bridge rectifier here. And then you have two different regulators, one for positive 5 volts and one for negative 5 volts. And the first thing we see, if we look closely, is that these two regulators are 7805 and 7905, and these are linear regulators, which means that they are going to dissipate quite a bit of power. And in fact, I did some measurement inside the unit, and the transformer is approximately a 12 volt transformer. So it means basically that more than half of the power um, that is consumed by the unit is dissipated in the form of heat. And that's an issue because if we take our power directly from the output of these LDOs, uh, it's going to put them under a lot of stress. And in addition, there are some things on that schematic that leads me to believe that these regulators were not designed to take on any additional load. And specifically here, we have one terminal and they say two IEC bus or battery unit because these frequency counters can have either a GPIB option or a battery option. And this line here comes directly from the input of the LDO, directly from the output of the full bridge rectifier, and it's an unregulated output. And the IEC bus unit is just a, uh, a logic board. I mean, it doesn't use a lot of power, but still, they provided this unit with unregulated power, and it is the responsibility of the accessory board to generate their own power straight from the input there. So that leads me to believe that it's not okay to take any significant load from any of these LDOs. And another thing that we notice here is that um, the power switch is here, here, and here. So that's pretty good because it means that only, only the regulated power is turned off when you turn off that switch, but the unregulated power here is always on. And that makes sense because you have a battery option and if the, the unit is plugged into mains power, even if the instrument is off, you want to have the capability to charge the battery. So that's why they made it that way. And it's super helpful to me because it means that if I want my OCXO to be turned on all the time, then it's super easy. I simply have to wire the power of my OCXO to that line here. And uh, I can then generate whatever voltage I need for the OCXO from there. So that's what I did for the power of the OCXO. And that's why on my custom design, you have a small switching regulator module here that generates the five volts for the OCXO. Before going further, it made sense to do a quick power supply test of the unit. So what I decided to do is to use my lab power supply to power my uh, circuit and see what's the power consumption. So the first time you turn on a circuit like this, 
obviously you want to do it step by step. You want to solder maybe the power supply first, don't solder the OCXO as it's the most expensive part, just to make sure there are no short circuits or anything like that. Uh, check the output voltage and so on. But here, um, in the benefit of uh, having a relatively short video, I'm going to do uh, uh, to go straight to the most interesting part, which is the power consumption test. So I've set up my power supply uh, at 12 volts because this is approximately the output voltage of the transformer. So this is going to be the most realistic conditions for testing. And we will see what happens with the power supply consumption. So if I turn on this power supply, we see that the current which is being used by the device is approximately 200 milliamps. And this is significant because had I've been using a linear regulator, um, I would the, the current used would, would have been more than twice that, so approximately half an amp, which would be significant for a 7805 to dissipate. So that, that's pretty interesting. And in fact, we see that the value is climbing. Um, this power supply has a fancy graph view, so we can actually see how it looks like. A and sure enough, we, we can see that, um, I'm, I don't know if it's clear on the video, but the power consumption is climbing and then it's going to get maybe a bit higher and higher and then it will start getting lower and lower as the, um, the, the enclosure basically of the EOCXO is uh, hot enough. So it's definitely interesting to see and we're going to wait for a while. I'm going to accelerate the video a bit and we'll see what it looks like after a while. Okay, so it's been approximately two minutes. What we can notice is that the power consumption starts at around 200 milliamps, goes up to 250 milliamps, that's at 12 volts, and then goes sharply down to approximately 100 milliamps once the oven is hot. And that's, uh, yeah, it asympt asymptotically goes to approximately 100 milliamps. So that, that will be um, the normal current consumption of the oven once it's hot. Uh, it's also good to see that the oven stabilizes relatively quickly, but that the, the rough stabilization, in order to get the good measurements and the best precision possible from the OCXO, obviously you have to wait for days and maybe even weeks for it to stabilize. And that brings me to a comment I wanted to make earlier regarding why it's important to leave these OCXOs plugged in all the time. There is a phenomenon which is called retrace. And what that phenomenon is, is that if you have an OCXO like that, you, you leave it turned on for maybe even two years, and then you calibrate it, and then it will be dead on in, in terms of frequency. But then you turn it off, and then you wait a few months. For instance, you don't use the instrument, you put it in a closet, or you're moving, you, you forget it in a box, and then you say, hey, I have a counter, it's been calibrated relatively recently, um, it, it should be dead on in terms of frequency. You turn it back on, you wait for a month, and then what you notice if you calibrate it again is that it may or may not have come back to the frequency it was before. And, and that's, that's the phenomenon which, which is called retrace. Basically, it means that if you turn on an OCXO, turn it off for some time and turn it back on again, it will settle on a frequency which can be different from the frequency it was before. And this is extremely poorly characterized if uh, you look at the data sheet of the DOC. So the reason for that is because um, it, there's a lot of variation in that phenomenon between different crystals. So it means that some will be fine uh, and some will have a huge retrace error. So that's why it's important if you're dealing with an OCXO like that to, you, to put it in your instrument, you calibrate it, and then you don't touch it, you leave it on all the time. If you have to send your instrument for calibration, you unplug it, send it for calibration, they calibrate it, then you get back your instrument and you plug it back on immediately because the retrace error is going to be lower the lower the time the instrument has been plugged off. So yeah, we can see that um, we now have reached a steady state of approximately 100 milliamp in terms of power consumption. So yeah, it's, um, it's good to know. And that seems to be definitely within the capabilities of the power supply. Which tells, what leads me to say that is because if you look at the data sheet of the um, PM6669 or PM6665 counters, you will see that the charging time for the battery, if you look at the capacity and so on, you see that this is approximately the current which is being used to charge the battery. So the transformer inside the unit is definitely dimensioned to support this type of permanent current. So 
that's good. It looks like uh, the design we have here in terms of, uh, yeah, there's also a power LED here. Uh, the design we have here in terms of power consumption is totally compatible with the counter. One question you may ask now is, how did I design this circuit board? How did I know which signal goes where? What is the, um, the signal shape? Which type of OCX I should use? And so on and so on. So there are two types of, well, many types of OCX source, but two categories. You have some that output a sine wave signal and some that output a logic level signal. And considering the, the schematics of that board, uh, it's so sim the board is so simple that you can almost read the schematics and it's, uh, it's also in the service manual, but basically the output of um, 74 hu 4 which is basically a logic gate circuit at five volts, is fed directly into the output terminal here. So it means that um, this oscillator is outputting a 5 volts, 10 megahertz um, lo logic uh, level signal and, and it's probably a, s a square wave signal. So the OCXO I've decided to use here also uses a 5 volt square wave output signal. So it's going to be compatible. And regarding the pinout of the connector, again, it's super simple. Um, basically, we can see two traces here. Um, this one goes straight into a capacitor, which is most likely a decoupling capacitor. And then if you look at the data sheet for the chip, pin one is um, the, the VCC of the chip. So that's definitely our five volt input. And this terminal here is uh, the output because in fact, there's no other signal. So that must be the output. And if we look closely on the circuit board, we can see that there are two ground pins which are connected to the ground plane here. Uh, what leads me to believe it's a ground plane is simply because the other side of the decoupling capacitor is connected to the ground plane. And also this is confirmed if we look into the, the service manual. So super simple design. What took me some time is actually to research what type of connectors they were using here because I wanted to make a drop-in replacement which was entirely compatible. I didn't want to have to mutilate this original board if for any reason I want to use it again. So I didn't want to remove that connector. I was able to find a matching connector on DigiKey after looking uh, into the, the pages and entering a few filters such as the number of terminals and things like that. So the color is different, but it's definitely the same size. I measured everything with a caliper. I looked at the data sheet, everything is fine. So that's basically it. And the reason why I used a small DC to DC power module here is because frankly, it makes it made my life much easier. Um, it, maybe it's not the best quality module, but the power rejection um, of the OCXO is pretty high, which, which means that even if the power supply is not super stable, it's not going to have a huge effect on the output frequency of the, the, the OCXO. However, what was super important, going to turn this off for the benefit of um, show, showing in the video and turning off the power LED, what was really important is to make sure that the adjustment voltage of the OCXO, the voltage which, which is used to trim the frequency of the SOXO, was super stable. And in order for that to happen, uh, the good practice is to use a, a voltage reference. And if we look at the data sheet of that particular OCX, so the range for the adjustment pin is between zero and four volts. So what I did is I simply used a four volts reference and I've chosen one with a relatively low temperature coefficient because the whole purpose of having an OCXO is to have a low temperature coefficient for the entire circuit. So uh, I've put a small reference there and then I have uh, a trimmer, um, a multi-ton trimmer here, which, which has been chosen so that once the, the board is inside the, the, the instrument like this, I can use a screwdriver from the top and I can finely trim the frequency um, so that it gives 10 megahertz and, and nothing else. And finally, the reason I put a small fuse and a varistor here is because if you remember the schematics of the, um, the, the counter, there's little to no filtering. In fact, um, there's a line filter here, but that's only for EMC considerations. And there's no fuse, there, there's nothing. There might be probably a thermal fuse or something yeah, here, right there. There's a fuse in the transformer, but that's it, so not, not much production. And, and um, these small, um, modules like that with the MLCC caps and um, the switcher IC are pretty sensitive to voltage spikes. So I just wanted to have some production here. Uh, honestly, it's a bit overkill, but that, that's the way I did it. 
uh, it, it shows that it's very important to connect your instrument to a search protected outlet uh, because these, especially these ancient instruments, not these brand new stuff, but the, the old ones were very poorly protected. So yeah, these are the, the main design consideration that I had to take into account wh when doing my design. By now, I'm sure you're all wondering, does it fit? And does it fit as well as the original board? So the way it fits inside is you have these two guide rays on the side and you simply connect like this and then it clips in place. You have some clips that hold it in place. So the original one, obviously it fits really well. Does the replacement fit? Well, yes, it does, obviously, uh, but I had to do some adjustments. Let me show you. So it, it does make a nice clip. Uh, everything is held in place, but I did make a small mistake w when I did the, the design originally. And specifically speaking, um, I forgot to remove some epoxy here. And this is super important for the guide rates here so that, it, so that the, the small tab that you have here fits inside the hole on the guide rail uh, on each side. So I had to simply make a quick correction. As you can see, this has been reworked. But beside that, the dimensions are the same. Everything is fine. Um, the position of the connector is the same. Uh, it's a very simple design. Um, one thing I did for this first version, well, it says actually revision two, but there was no revision one because I did a big mistake and I immediately had to make a revision two. Um, there is a jumper here, which allows me to power the OCXO from the five volts of the instrument if I wanted to. But for the reasons I explained before, I, I, I've chosen not to do it. It's bad for the OCXO, it's bad for the instrument. It's not the type of stuff that you, you want to do. And you may have noticed these three terminals here. Um, the reason I put these three extra terminals is because I wanted to add some LEDs on the front panel display to, to act as a backlight. So this provides me with an easy access uh, it's like a breakout board, breakout board for the um, for the five plus five volts, minus five volts, and ground. And also, I have provision for series resistors on the PCB, so I can simply connect two or three LEDs, and these LEDs will be turned on and off when I turn the instrument on and off. So yeah, pretty simple design. Uh, it does take a while to to do this because. Uh, as I've shown, you, you, you really want to make sure you understand the power circuit of the instrument. You want to make sure you don't overload it. You, you want to look closely at the service manual, if it's available, of course, to make sure that everything will be fine. Um, but once, once you know what you want to do, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, I made this circuit board at GLC PCB because, it's, uh, frankly, it's super cheap and fast. Uh, I, I have a few of them. Um, and uh, it's good because I have to remember, I have two of these counters, so I need one OCXO for each of them. Uh, one quick note regarding the precision of the instrument. This counter is not super precise. It goes down to 0.1 Hertz, if I'm not mistaken, when measuring 10 megahertz. And that's not a super, super high precision. So what I hope is that the precision of the OCXO is going to be good enough so that any inaccuracy of the OCXO is not going to be really visible in the display of the instrument. So basically it means I won't have to worry a lot about the uncertainty of the, um, the reference of the instrument when I do a frequency measurement. That, that, that's the whole point of a lab instrument like that. You want, you want it to be dependable and, and you want to trust its rating. So, so that's, uh, that's what I hope. Um, I also have a GPS DO, as I said in the beginning, which I will use to calibrate this. But sometimes you, the GPS DO might not be available. Um, so it's good to have an instrument which is dependable even without using an external frequency source or ref frequency reference. So that's it for now. Um, what I will do in another video, I'm going to show you how to calibrate this type of, um, of OCXO because it's not necessarily super straightforward. There are some precautions that you need to take, but I wanted to show you the design process. I wanted to show you what you can achieve uh, in a few hours or days of work. And uh, also I wanted to show you these beautiful instruments because frankly, uh, especially in North America, we don't see a lot of these Fluke or Philips counters. Uh, they are nice instruments, they are dependable. I've been having this PM6665 for approximately, I believe 12 years. Uh, it had a long life before and uh, unless there's uh, something that breaks internally, I'm sure it's going to last for, for a while because um, these are simple instruments, pretty useful. It has a GPIB option. Um, so you may have noticed extra rails here and here. 
Um, this is for an extra input. You can have a prescaler board here, which divides the signal by, uh, I believe, a factor of eight, and that allows you to measure a frequency of up to 1.3 gig. Um, I don't currently have that option board. It's frankly unobtainium. Uh, it cannot be found on eBay or anywhere else. There have been some efforts on the internet to design replacement boards for this type of instrument, but they have not been super successful. So maybe that could be a project for later, should I need to, to measure uh, this type of frequency. And also just a quick note, uh, this is the GPIB board, as I mentioned before. And what you can see here is the 7805, which generates the five volt for this board. So this is what uh, made me designing my own power supply in my OCXO board because the f if they did this, this, this is probably because the, um, the original regulators, the 7805 and 7809, um, which are in the, the main unit, are definitely not dimensioned to handle any extra load. So that, that's why it was super important that each module has its own power supply, GPIB has one, uh, and my, uh, my OCXO will also have its own power supply. And because it's a switching power supply, it's going to make the most efficient use possible of the output current capability of the transformer. So yeah, uh, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, small video. Uh, I will make another video on calibration and maybe uh, a few improvements I, I made on this unit because I have a solar revision coming my way. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I always like to share my project like that. Uh, if you found this helpful, uh, you can leave me a comment. If you have an instrument like that, uh, we can discuss. What's good to know also is this type of board, it can be used for other instruments. Uh, you can either make your own or you can reuse a board like that and simply wire the output differently. So it's pretty useful to have this type of stuff laying around in the lab or even to do a quick check of any other instrument. So thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye.